Next on Conversations, acclaimed documentary filmmaker David Grubin. I get to follow my curiosity. I'm pretty lucky that way. We sit down with the renowned PBS storyteller to talk about his newest film, The Buddha. The Buddha story is really asking ultimate kinds of questions. There's so much wisdom in this story that can become a part of you. Up next, the challenges of bringing the spiritual story to life. There's part of the story which really speaks of another, another world almost. It's, it's sort of the, the supernatural side of the story. His close encounter with the Dalai Lama. Really, that was the most serious fun I've ever had. He's such a joyful presence. And his take on filmmaking today. Sometimes a story comes to you, but when you want to do a story, it's not that easy because then you've got to go out and find the funds. David Grubin, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. David Grubin, welcome to Conversations. Good to have you here in Seattle. And it's great to be here. The Buddha. Tell me how, uh, mm -hmm. tell me how this all came about in yeah. doing a documentary, really a biography about the Buddha. Mm -hmm. It's a film I've wanted to do for a long time, and it took a, a long time to raise the funds, as, as you know, at, at PBS, it's not that easy. Right. Um, but, um, you know, it, for me, it feels like a long way from LBJ, which is a film I made in 1990, uh, to do The Buddha. Um, I, um, I'm not a Buddhist. I uh, didn't become a Buddhist after making this film. But there's so much of Buddhist practice that can enter into your life. There's so much wisdom in this story that can become a part of you. And uh, I wanted to explore that story. I knew the story, but I didn't really know it in any kind of depth. And this was an opportunity to do that. Well, let's talk about that. How much did you know about the Buddha, yeah, about Buddhism, right. before you even started this project? I'd read the Hermann Hesse Siddhartha when I was in college. But you know, it didn't really touch me. And um, it's only recently that it's begun to, that it began to matter, maybe the last few years, maybe a, just a function of, uh, age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, the Buddha story is really asking ultimate kinds of questions. Uh, so I didn't really know much, and that's the way I make most of my films, out of a kind of ignorance, you know, I want to learn. And uh, and hopefully, as I'm learning, that, that feels fresh to me, I'm bringing that to the audience. The start of this, uh, even the conversation about doing this mm. film, how, no, how long ago? And yeah. tell me about the path, the journey yeah. to get here to even make it come to life on public television. Yeah, it, it, is, a, it is a journey. Um, let's say four years ago, I started thinking and reading. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And gradually, as you read, you begin to get a sense of it. So here's a big question. Do you make a film about the historical Buddha? That is, do you go in search of this man. He was a human being. He lived 2,500 years ago. Do we try to follow his footsteps? Well, what I learned was fascinating, that the Buddha becomes a myth. He be turns into a legend almost immediately after his death. And in the 19th century, scholars set off to find the historical Buddha, and they came up empty-handed. And that freed me because I really didn't want to go in search of the historical Buddha. So when I found out you really can't find him, I could do what I wanted to do, which was to tell his story and to try to understand the story, which is actually what scholars do today. They're interested in that story and the meaning of the story and the message of hope that the story carries.
So tell me about telling the story mm -hmm. and, and the way that you decided to do it. I mean, it's a two-hour yes. piece here. That's a, that's a lot of uh, landscape to cover. Yes. Uh, but in some respects, it's a lot of time, but yet it isn't, particularly dealing with this kind of topic. Yeah, so the life of the Buddha, the, kind, the, the story of the life, leads you into the way in which you're going to tell it. So in other words, you know that he was born, the stories say, a prince, that he lived in a palace, that he knew every imaginable kind of luxury, that his parents protected him from knowing pain or suffering and knowing anything about that. Parents want to protect their children. So I could understand that. And then at a certain point, he decides he wants to know what life is really about. And he goes off in search. That is, he grows up and he leaves home. So that's the way the story begins. Now, how do you tell this kind of a story? Um, what are the elements? What can a filmmaker bring to that? Well, first of all, the filmmaker has 2,500 years of great Buddhist art, which you can use to tell the story. That's excited me. It meant going to, I don't know, 100, 100 museums and bringing in 2,500 paintings and trying to figure out which ones tell the story best. But I didn't want it to only be the art. I wanted to go to India and go to the sites that are part of the story. That is, there, is, there are traditional places where pilgrims go to celebrate the Buddha, to be in the presence of the Buddha. Where the Buddha was born, that's Lumbini, Nepal where he achieved enlightenment, that's Bodh Gaya, India, Sarnath, where he delivered his first teaching, and where he died, Kushinagara, India. Those are the primary sites. You can go there, and you can feel this pilgrimage, the, the, the pilgrimage to understand the spirit of the Buddha. We could go there, we could film that, and we did that. That was obviously very exciting. But India also contains um, what shall we say, echoes of the Buddha's world. That is, as you know, when the Buddha sets off in search of enlightenment, in search of understanding the nature of life and of suffering, he tries different, he, he has different means he, he, that he uses to try to get this enlightenment, this understanding. Well, one of them is he studies yoga, and uh, he's very good at it. Well, there are Indians today that are practicing yoga, and we film with a yogi, and, and the yoga is extraordinary. So it becomes a dialogue with the past. The, the Buddha tries asceticism. We f there are ascetics today, people who are mortifying their bodies, punishing the flesh, uh, standing on one foot uh, for as long as they can. Uh, it, incredible. They still do that today, not eating. Uh, the Buddha tried all that. But you can film with an ascetic. Right. So you're able to basically capture the past with the paintings and the historians and all of those that know everything about him, but also bring the present because it's still being lived out today by so many people. Yes, that, that was exciting to me, that you could make it a dialogue with the past. The Dalai Lama is mm. involved in this and he's, he is uh, featured. You are your own master. Future, everything depends on your own shoulder. Buddha. Buddha's responsibility is just to show the path. That's all. Tell me about, mm. I guess, getting mm. him to agree to be mm. a part of this, but mm. that experience. Wow, that really, that was the most serious fun I've ever had. He's such a joyful presence, and yet you're, you know it's serious, but he's just glowing with, with the kind of happiness that, <laughs> yeah. uh, that really goes right to you, and he really, uh, you know, he really engages with you. And um, to get this interview, you, I wrote the, his, his office, and about a month later, requesting it, I got an got email back and it said, yes, uh, you can have an interview with His Holiness. Um, and then it said, uh, the date, March 22nd, let's say it was, 11 o'clock. Santa Barbara, <laughs> 20 minutes. He's so scheduled, oh, it was okay. laid out like that. So you don't say, well, maybe can you postpone Can't it? Can't fit it into my schedule can that day, right. You go, and you're hoping to get more time, 
and I did because you're, you're engaging in this conversation. At a certain point, the room is filled and somebody gets behind him and starts pointing to the watch and you, two more questions, you know. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very moving, moving experience. It, it, it's like everyone says, it's, he, he is an extraordinary human being. The one thing that in this uh, documentary, I don't know if this is the first time that you've ever done this. Uh, I know you've done a mm -hmm. lot of historic characters, and, or actually mm -hmm. historic people. Um, and that is that you mix the, the kind of, uh, what is the traditional storytelling mm -hmm. with film and shooting on location, but with animation. But you didn't do computer animation. Mm -hmm. you, it was all handmade. Yes, I, animation was really a new thing to, to use 25 minutes in a documentary and part of the challenge is to weave that animation together with the film so that they each have their own authenticity. And what I was trying to do was to say, wait a minute, there is there's part of this story which really speaks of another, another world almost. It's, it's sort of the, the supernatural side of the story. You know the, the Buddha is born out of the side of his mother. Uh, the Buddha makes miracles. So I wanted to create this other world, but to do it in a way where you feel, well, wait a minute. One of the principles of Buddhism is our own world is, uh, is illusory. Um, so that this reality can call into question our own reality. Not that it's not substantial, we're sitting in chairs, uh, but yet things are changing all the time. And so I wanted the animation to represent that, the kind of animation, hand-drawn, but not cutty. You know, I don't go from a wide shot to a cut to a close-up. You see an elephant and the lines change. The elephant becomes a, a butterfly. You know, a, a dog becomes a cat. Uh, so that's, again, that's Buddhism, impermanence, change, flow. So the animation is in the style of the Buddhist philosophy. How did you go about determining that you wanted to add animation? Was it the first time you've ever had that? I've put small you know, bits of animation in, you know, in the Brain series, for example. Mm -hmm. We used the animation, but the computer generated a whole different kind, very scientific, to show what the brain looks like, but never so substantially in storytelling. That was more illustrative. This was really part of the storytelling. Remember, I'm telling the story right. of the Buddha. And I wanted that story to continue in another form. And I'm not an animator, so I found wonderful animators, Asterix Films, and they did a great job. And I worked very closely with them back and forth, uh, trying to get those little stories, those little animated stories, just right. You're Jewish? Yes. Okay. You're secular Jew? Is that Sec I'm very right. secular. Very secular. So I I'm kind of wondering. Was there any interconnection here or any experiences that you had as being a secular Jew and what you found in mm -hmm. doing the story and Buddhism? Well, I would say that whether you're a secular Jew or a religious Jew, whether you're, you're a Christian, a Muslim, Buddhist practices can enter into your life even if you have no particular faith. Uh, because, and that is why I think Buddhism is spreading so, so rapidly and why people are so interested. Because you can use Buddhist wisdom, you can use meditation uh, to help you to, to enrich your life without it changing uh, your belief system, if, if, if you would like, you know. Do you see uh, a timeliness with this story, mm. considering the stresses and difficulties mm. and the turbulent times that we're living in now? I, I see it in a lot of ways. I mean, there has to be some reason why so many people are interested in Buddhist practices today. That so many people are going on retreats, uh, are using meditation, are interested in the Buddha's life and his philosophies. And I think it is because the, it's, the world is uh, bewildering, uh, particularly in the West uh, with its you know, material-driven culture. Uh, Buddha's interested in, in something else. Uh, the violence in the world. The Buddha, of course, uh, believed in nonviolence. Um, 
and and I, I think there is a I've seen tremendous interest in uh, in this particular film because of uh, this uh, this interest in the Buddha. Um, Richard Gere is the narrator. Siddhartha was alone in the world for the first time. On the bank of a nearby river, he drew his sword. Although my father and stepmother were grieving with tears on their faces, he said, I cut off my hair, I put on the yellow robes, and went forth from home into homelessness. Was he for your first choice right off the bat? He always was. First of all, he, I knew he would be a good at narrator. He's, right. a, he's a wonderful actor. But it's, it's terrific when the narrator speaks with authority. When he reads the script, he knows what he's reading. And when I gave him the, the, the script, uh, and when we sat down to do the, the recording, he would say, oh, you know, this, I don't know if I agree with this, a couple points, and we sharpened it up. So I think uh, it helped to improve the script. So uh, I, I always think it's good when the narrator has a kind of intelligence, a kind of integrity. Uh, and that, they're really that, connected with the yeah, subject matter in this case. you feel that in the voice. So he's more than a celebrity reading. He, he's a committed Buddhist. Yeah. Well, he's made waves, I think, at the Academy Awards, and I don't think they really wanted him <laughs> back after he made some political statements mm -hmm. in this whole thing. <laughs> oh, what about the politics mm -hmm. in Buddhism? Because obviously the Dalai Lama is a controversial character mm -hmm. in some respects because mm -hmm. of China's view mm -hmm. about... Uh, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama and, and what the Dalai Lama has said about China. Mm. Do you address much of this? This is a film about the life of the Buddha. So it's not about Buddhism. Right. That is, we don't explore Zen Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism in Southeastern Asia. It's about the life of the Buddha and Tibetan Buddhists, the Dalai Lama or Zen Buddhists, like Pulitzer Prize winning poet uh, W.S. Merwin, they come from their own traditions, but I don't think you would even know it because they're all working this story, which has been interpreted for thousands of years. They're giving their interpretation. So when it comes to the politics, uh, we address the Buddha's idea of politics, and Dalai Lama had a wonderful thing to say about it. Uh, but we don't address uh, contemporary political issues as such, uh, although it's, I think you could see how the Buddha's philosophy could be, apply to global warming, the economy, uh, war. Let's talk about uh, David Grubin, the filmmaker. How long have you been doing this? Goodness, let's see. I would say 40 years or so. How did you get into this, mm. this line of work? Yeah, I was lucky, you know, when I was starting out, uh, I was, when I was out of college, I didn't have mountains of debt to pay off. And I could just give it a try and to see. And as soon as I started working in film, I just loved it. I knew. And I see that today in my own cutting room when young people come. And you could tell the ones that just, they just love it. And that's, I did. And so I just got started, you know, hauling cables around and assistant camera and came up on the technical side uh, because I wanted to learn to shoot, to be a cameraman. Cinema Verite was the thing then. And um, I shifted into, um, historical filmmaking and, and writing the films. And so now I write them and sometimes I shoot them. Uh, but the writing is so key to these kinds of films uh, and that's the direction I went. Do you consider yourself a storyteller or a historian? Because mm. so much of your work really has dealt with history. Yes, I have to honestly say that I feel like I'm a filmmaker, storyteller first, although I, um, I try as hard as I can to, to base this in the best possible history. I haven't spent my life studying, um, let's say, Napoleon, who I made a film about, right. that some people do. I think I get a chance to talk to the best historians, uh, and I come up with my own points of view. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I get to follow my curiosity. I'm pretty lucky that way. Um, and then I work with these wonderful historians, and I work. I think I'm you know, standing on their shoulders all the time. Talk a bit about history. I mean, you've done American Experience, uh, LBJ, FDR, Truman, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Abraham and Mary Lincoln. Um, you've done. You've worked with Bill Moyers, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the Yoda of uh, 
broadcast journalism. And, you know, he's about ready to uh, make his way out of doing the weekly thing. Um, how close are the two of you? Well, we worked for many years together, and I think we shared a common curiosity. You know, Bill has also covered just about every kind of uh, story, and I always loved that about him, is that uh, his view of journalism was wide and broad. Um, now, of course, Bill can, can do one story after another on his, on his show. I tend to take, you know, a long time to do one particular story. But I, f I felt that our, our, our collaboration worked very, very well. Um, you know, documentary uh, filmmaking as a line of work is not the easiest <laughs> because uh, you got to go find money. Mm. You got to come up with a story that's really going to reach mm. uh, masses if you can mm. really do that. Mm -hmm. um, what's been the challenge for you in getting this done? Well, sometimes a story comes to you. Somebody asked me, the American Experience asked me to do a film about Robert Oppenheimer. They knew me. That's, that was a wonderful idea. I would have never come up with that idea. But when you want to do a story, it's not that easy because then you've got to go out and find the funds. And it took quite a while to put the package together for this particular story. It doesn't exactly fit on any strand on PBS, you know, where, where would it exactly fit? But PBS was tremendously supportive right from the beginning, and I'm lucky because I can talk to them and, and, and engage their interest. But the challenge is in making the film that you feel that you need to make next. Has PBS, uh, as a venue, obviously, it's, it's been the place where mm. you've had many of your films yeah. uh, air, but um, it, have, if you didn't have that, mm. I feel that PBS is really my home. The kind of films that I want to make, PBS wants to show. The PBS audience is interested in the kind of films that I'm interested in. And I feel that when I make a film, when I'm making myself happy with the film, I feel I'll make my audience happy and PBS happy. Uh, there's no place like PBS. It's, uh, it's serious about what it does. Um, it's great that there are no commercials. <laughs> I don't have to think of the program as, you know, for our commercial breaks. You right. know, have you ever come. looked at doing it for other entities, like an HBO or Showtime or anything like that? No, I never have. Because um, you had your home base there, you've been able to make it. Yeah, and uh, as, I say, as I say, PBS allows me to, to do what I want to do, and I, I, I hope I can continue. I, I found this interesting. I was reading on your website, and you say, uh, this is what you wrote. For me, documentary filmmaking is a process of discovery, an opportunity to wander along some unmarked shore with my mind open and my senses of alert. I love to be surprised. Kind of sounds very Buddhist <laughs> the way you write there. Well, it's true that you need to feel um, whatever happens is going to happen, and you've got to be able to to take it in and not be thrown by it. I mean, that's the great thing about documentary filmmaking, whether you have a camera on your shoulder and you're trying to figure out what's going on or whether you're, you know, you're in a mountain full of brute, uh, meaningless facts until you put them all together. So there's a state of confusion you have to feel right. comfortable with. This is, a, in fact, you had another line here, making documentaries requires comfort with disorder. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Well, that's, life is disorderly. And what you're doing if you're a documentary filmmaker or, or an artist is you're trying to make some kind of sense out of it. Uh, you're trying to put it together. And so uh, what is the story of the Buddha? What does it mean? Uh, which parts of it am I going to tell and, and why? Uh, or if I take a camera out and I'm just filming, again, it's... It's a mess, you know. It's and we're kind always of like a puzzle, like sense. a big puzzle, and you're trying to put it together yeah, and, and find the pieces. Yeah, stories give us order. So I'm, try I'm a storyteller, you know, right. and that's the kind of order I like to give it. Stories which don't preach, uh, which contain values, but uh, ask questions. Um, and I try to enter into situations with a kind of, a, say, an empathetic imagination. Um, and feel my way into, into it so that I'm not so much an investigative journalist uh, who's reporting on the, you know, uh, on, on the facts uh, in that sense, but I'm rather trying to uh, 
um, give you the sort of the, the emotional quality of, of things and that emotional quality of ideas. History makes, it makes for good storytelling. I think history is a great opportunity for doing just that, you know, to make the past alive, to, to make sense out of it, and to make it visceral, because this is that kind of medium. We've got music, we've got the sounds of the past. It, it, it's a great medium for making you feel uh, that the past is present. From Buddha, where do you go next? That's such a good question. I, I, I really, uh, I'm not, I've never really been kind of stumped before in that way. I've always really? had something I wanted to do. Well, because if you do LBJ, you're led to FDR, you're led to Truman and Theodore Roosevelt. You want to go back to the greatest of all presidents, Abraham Lincoln. So there's a whole series of things. Um, but with the Buddha, what do you do after you make a film about the Buddha? You haven't figured that out yet? You don't know where the next project is at this point? I'm going to just um, let, let the confusion reign and uh, see what happens. Yes, it is very Buddhist. We'll just, we'll just see. All right. Well, I hope you find your path. <laughs> <laughs> David Grubin, it's been great talking to you. Uh, congratulations on this. And uh, we'll look to see what comes down the road, another bit of history and uh, your great storytelling. Great Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.